Geneva in 1925, when all the nations of the earth after World War I eliminated poison gas as a means of warfare. Everybody kept their gas masks. And that uh, this was kind of a gas mask, I was suggesting, because someplace down the line, in a later generation, we know how to make those missiles. You can't wipe the knowledge out of people's minds. There may come a madman someday that would reintroduce nuclear weapons. Mr. Mr. President, yeah. uh, Mr. Regan suggested that there was a difference in tone on the part of Mr. Gorbachev between the plenary sessions and the sessions with you. Since you're by far our best source on what went on in the one-on-one -on -one sessions, could you tell us a little bit about that difference in tone? And also, what do you feel the one-on-one -on -one device contributed to the substance of the meeting? Well, I think it was a great measure of the success of the meeting. I don't think it's been done so much anymore. But we sat there in a room and I told him, here we are, and between us, uh, we could come up with things that could probably bring peace for years and generations to come. And if we could erase these things that have made us, as I say, suspicious of each other, the, uh, no, they were very worthwhile. And I, I think I'm some judge of acting, so I don't think he was acting. Uh, he, I believe, is just as sincere as we are in wanting an answer. At the same time, he comes from the vantage point of that system and uh, even in talking, for example, about human rights, uh, uh, he feels that uh, human rights are being violated in our country. And, uh, Mr. President, uh, that was going to be my question. Uh, you obviously talked very strongly to uh, Mr. Gorbachev about your feelings about human rights. What intrigued me in reading the joint statement was that there was a one-sentence reference, an allusion to human rights, rather than the mere mention of it as a category. My question is, was this your way of conceding publicly to Mr. Gorbachev that you were not going to beat him over the head publicly about human rights? The fact that it was just one sentence long. I know this is all on the record here, Will you just believe me and trust me when I say that I believe and I believe the past record indicates that that is not a subject that should be brought out publicly and some kind of an agreement signed uh, because in a world of politics to try and push someone in a corner in which he must then publicly try to get out of that corner and in doing so appear to be taking orders from a figure in another government, that becomes an impossibility. Uh, all I can say is it is a subject that we went into quite deeply, and uh, I think we should just wait and uh, see what happens. Did you bring up with him specific cases, sir? Just Did you bring up with him specific cases? Uh, types of cases. Mr. Yeah. Mr. President, just so I can button this up, uh, I don't want to put a word in your mouth, but in essence, are you agreeing with the thrust of my question that the one sentence reference to human rights was your way of not, as you say, making it appear publicly that he's following orders from another leader? Uh, yes, I think we would run the risk then of setting back what might have been might be accomplished. Mr. President. <coughs> Was the level of distrust that exists between the systems and the leaders, for that matter, really <coughs> diminished? And if the people in the Congress of the United States and around the country get the idea that there is a basis for less distrust, doesn't that impair your ability to get funding for SDI and for defense programs? No, it, well, if we can arrive at a solution that's calling for substantial reductions in weapons and so forth, this is the only legitimate way in which you can reduce uh, defense spending uh, when, if you can establish that the need is not there. Well, that has not been accomplished. There is mistrust. Uh, for example, he feels that the industrial military complex in our country is exerting an influence for its own ends on creating mistrust of the Soviet Union so that they can sell more weapons. I responded with the fact that the percentage of money that is spent on weapons, or the amount of money as a percentage of gross national product, we'd be better off if we didn't have to spend it. 
Mr. Mr. President, you said last night, oh, excuse me, sir. All right. You said last night we moved arms control forward from where we were last January. Uh, does that go beyond just telling the negotiators in Helsinki and in Geneva to work faster? Or are there, are there more specific things you can tell us about moving arms control forward from where we were in January? The SDI still remains a problem with that regard. On the other hand, however, we did come to an agreement <coughs> on the overall total that we're both agreed we would like to see reduced. And that we're both on the record as agreeing to that. There are some details to be worked out because each country has a different mix of weapon types. And it takes a little maneuvering and figuring to find out how you can keep parity with a 50% reduction and not create an advantage or disadvantage depending on how, which systems you applied it to or how you applied it. So these are the details that will be being worked on by our people in Geneva at the arms control. Did you agree on a single limit to offensive What's missiles? That? Did you agree to a single numerical limit that both sides agreed on, sir? Yes, we said a 50 percent reduction. President, did you, discern, did you discern any play, any negotiating play in either the area of research or testing or development so that the <coughs> Our arms negotiators and theirs at Geneva can begin to work with research or testing or development in some way so that there can be some give on, on what is the choking point. With regard to when SDI. You would, when you would, yeah, with regard to SDI. Well, I can only hope that now, with all that's been said between us and as they consider and have time to consider what I had offered in connection with this and see that this is not an effort to achieve a first strike capacity on our part uh, or to have some kind of an advantage, an advantage over them in view of what it was that I had offered and I, I left my argument with the <coughs> that admonition to look at what we had said with regard to the open laboratories on both sides and with regard to my proposal that this then be made available to all and see if that did not answer their fears and concerns that we were coming to a militarization of space. Are you tired? Huh? Are you tired? Not really. But, uh, as a matter of fact, I, the only time I figure I'm tired is if I go to sleep before the rest of the staff do. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, Mr. President, one, 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 one final question. Can you tell us whether you're prepared to extend uh, SALT II? Uh, that was a discussion at the beginning of the week about what we're going to do about SALT II. Did you discuss that with Gorbachev? All of this was discussed and I made it plain that we, uh, that I was going back to a report for further study that had just been delivered prior to the trip about their violations of SALT II and uh, that we certainly were not going to bind ourselves to something uh, that was not equally binding on them. Now, this is pretty much what I said uh, some time ago, that uh, we, I don't think this is classified, I think I'm safe to say to you, we have found 23 violations of uh, the SALT II agreement. And uh, these are things that, that have to be cleared up between us. Does he deny those violations? What? Does he deny those violations? Uh, we didn't get an answer on that. Are you looking forward to showing this country, Mr. President? Are you looking forward to show uh, the General Secretary this country? I'm going to have to go here. I'm, yeah, but, yes. well, Secretary of State already President, does it. In the event that there is a misunderstanding between you about what actually happened, in the walk through the woods or along the lake. Uh, may I ask whether any report was made by the interpreters involved as to what actually was said? Yes, both interpreters take notes, of course, and they've made available to them to their own sides. Sometimes I have to tell you that uh, I'm afraid I cheated on my interpreter and his notes might not be completely accurate. I told you that Mr. Gorbachev is a good listener, and I have to tell you that I'd get carried away. He would be looking at me so intensely, and I would be talking, and I'd forget all about that it has to be. I was just assuming that he was understanding what I was saying, until finally, out of sheer mercy for my interpreter, 
a couple of times he had to put his hand up and point to the interpreter <laughs> of mine and I'd say no so then I'd look and see my interpreter turning page after page trying to keep up with what, what I had said. Uh, in the plenary meetings, of course, we had simultaneous, so there was no problem, but it was actually true. I just would sort of get going and forget that he wasn't understanding. And I proved that he wasn't understanding because I told him a couple of jokes and he never laughed until he gave the interpretation. <laughs> but let me just say, and I have to go here, and George is coming in. I just have to say with all my belief, my most sincere belief, that we did establish uh, a relationship that is, as you know now, scheduled and going to lead uh, to future meetings. And it really did happen, not as the result of negotiation out on, or in one of the meetings. We were concerned. This was an important agenda item for us, future meetings. And we were concerned as to whether we could get such an agreement. And he and I, coming back from that little walk in the woods uh, down to the pool house, uh, were talking and talking lightly and about various just the things that fellows would talk about, and uh, he said something that I took as a kind of a cue line, and I invited him this coming year to come to our country, to come here for a meeting. And he said, I accept. And then he says, and I invite you to come to a subsequent meeting in Moscow. And I said, I accept. And I think when we both went in and told our teams that this was all settled, <laughs> they almost fell down. <laughs> there was no fight there. Thank, Thank, you, Mr. Thank, you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Secretary of State is back from.